Hello. <laughs> Thank you all. As this part of the slide says, my name is Steve. As this part of the slide says, I'm a bit of a geek. If we've all turned up to the correct book launch, this is a little talk about the book 20 Go To 10, Writing Retro. Over the next hour or so, I'm going to be talking a little bit what happened before the book, what was my life like before I started writing this thing. I'll then talk about some of the things I've learned whilst writing the book. That will bring in some things about old computers that will certainly interest the computer geeks amongst us. And then what happens once you've finished writing? Once you put that last full stop on the page, what then happens? So for those that haven't written a book and would like to perhaps write one in the future, this hopefully will start, stand as a lesson to you to not bother. <laughs> but before all of that, who am I? What have I done to earn a place on this stage? Or as the slide should normally be called, the ego slide. <laughs> this is where the speaker bags about themselves for 10 minutes while everyone else fiddles on their phone on Twitter or X, or whatever it's called these days. So who am I? Well, I'm a software developer. I'm a computer geek. I've always been a geek. I've developed in most fields, on most platforms, from IoT embedded stuff, education technology, cloud mobile, computer games. If it exists, I've probably had a go at it. I've authored some books on software best practice and very geeky things, which have sold to professional software developers. They sold about four and a half copies each, so I'm happy with that. Um, but they did pay me, at least. And I open source advocate. I speak at FOSDEM. I've, I've keynoted FOSDEM and a few other conferences because I stand up in front of people with an idea or something that I want to share. And as obviously I'm a retro computing enthusiast, I have a number of my own machines. I mess around with them. I program them. I've programmed the big machine outside the mega processor that you saw when you came in. And none of that's important. What's important is what's not on that slide. I don't actually work for the museum. I don't work at the, the university where I'm researching history. Everything I've learned and everything I've studied has been through what I've done, through people I've spoken to, things I've read about, which is a very long-winded way of saying, if I can do this, anyone can. So what are we talking about? Well, before the book, there was just me collecting ideas from people. I, I would be at a little group and meeting and someone would say, oh, did you know this thing about the Spectrum? Or did you know that thing about the Cocoa computer? And I was, I was interested in all these little pieces of information, these little pieces of anecdote, and I was writing them down. And it was actually, let me explain it in words that I actually took some time to plan. <laughs> and not only that, had edited for me. 20 Go To 10 is a book of numbers that describes the many facets of computing history, focusing on the golden age of old computers and retro games and consoles from the 1980s and 1990s. Now, the reason for starting there is because this, I thought, was the most popular part of computing history. Some people, they like the mini computers, the mainframes. There are enough people writing about that. There are a lot of people that write about this era, but what they're writing about is my favourite game on the spectrum or my favourite game here. I wanted to do something that was a little bit different and more broad than that. Also, every entry in the book starts with a number. And by choosing a related number, you'll create a unique adventure through the book into a web of forgotten geek lore and incredible facts. With luck, you'll find a way to arrive at the number used to grant infinity lives in Jet Set Willy on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. This is your goal. Because essentially, the book is playing out like a choose-your-own-adventure. You get to decide where you go and what you do. So, so I've mentioned that I'm a retro computing enthusiast, and I love the idea about learning the mechanics, the underlying mechanics of these machines. So whether it was basic or machine code or the hardware itself, I would study it. I would borrow every book from the library, and I, then I'd read every magazine. And then, because um, I had a ZX81 at the time, once I'd read all the ZX81 books, I'd go and read the books for all the other computers to see how I could translate those programs into those for the ZX81. Because there wasn't quite as many for the ZX81 as there were the BBC Micro, for example. So, by the, so I was interested in this, and through a couple of odd things, I came to this museum first in 2016. It was on a day trip, and I came here because I was doing some, um, some work on the Jupiter Ace. I was sort of preserving part of its history. And I came here to learn, well, what does the museum do? And is there any overlap? And funnily enough, there wasn't. So I thought, oh, well, that's nice. It's a nice place. I'll, I'll have to come back. 
Then the year after, through some really bad career luck and some very good personal life luck, I ended up moving to Cambridge. At which point it's like, oh, I can go to the museum every day if I want, which I almost did. But it meant that I got more immersed into the culture than I had previously. So by the time I actually began to volunteer here, explaining to visitors what the machines do and what goes on, I had amassed quite a breadth of knowledge across many machines, but rarely any significant depth. I enjoyed writing books because they required me to research deep topics, but I couldn't find any justification for writing about retro computers. Now, after all, so many blogs have already done it. So I started making notes of these anecdotes, the technology, the games, the people. And then I started collecting them from anyone that would actually share them with me. And as I started making notes of all of these stories, something kept popping out. They were all connected through numbers. I lodged that in the back of my head. And then a year or two, after, I realized that there's a connection that sometimes these numbers have multiple entries. Ah, numbers have, there's a connection there as well. And obviously everyone's attempted one program in BASIC. Normally it's 10 print Thomas is an idiot, 20 go to 10. And then I realized, ah, oh, go to. If people remember anything about BASIC, it's that go to statement, that thing it considered very, very harmful. Okay, so if I've got entries attached to numbers and there's lots of numbers and everyone remembers basic and go to, I should have a book where you can go anywhere in the book based on go to statements. And at that point I said, right, well, that's it. That's what the book is about. And it has to be called 20 go to 10. Unfortunately, it took about seven years to have that realization of that is a book that I can write that most other people probably couldn't because maybe they'd not been submersed in that culture of multiple machines. Of, of, of having and using a ZX81 and a Spectrum and a Dragon and a Commodore and even a Tatum Einstein. For the two people that sort of smiled when I said that, is there more than two people that know that machine? I've got one. Yeah, that's three of us. Where would I? Brilliant. So this is essentially what happened before there was any concept of the book. And that's why I decided I'd write this book in this way. So where do Unbound come in? Well, Unbound's the publisher and they're a crowdfunded publisher. Uh, which means they have sort of up front saying, if anyone actually likes this, this, the idea of this book, you should actually do something about it because we're not going to make it unless lots of people say. So what do Unbound say about themselves? Well, I'll try and read it in their own words. Unbound is the world's first crowdfunding publisher established in 2011. We believe that wonderful things can happen when you clear a path for people who share a passion. That's why we've built a platform that brings together readers and authors to crowdfund books they believe in and give fresh ideas that don't fit the traditional mould the chance they deserve. Well, this sort of book definitely doesn't fit any particular mould. Trying to explain, oh yeah, it's a book, but it doesn't go in order from beginning to end, is quite a hard sell. And the important thing that I read in their blurb is it's about the readers and the authors. It's not about, oh, the authors do their thing, and then the readers go and do something else. They're connected, there is always that discussion. So I found that whilst writing the book, and I was collecting more and more supporters, they were saying, oh, I really like the idea of this book. Don't forget to include this machine, will you? Are you going to write something about that? So all of a sudden, I'm being told what part of computing history I should be focusing on for the people that actually want this book. As a consequence, it is quite UK-centric. There are a lot of machines that, that were created here are in the book. And that's not really a surprise. The UK does have quite a good pedigree of creating good and innovative machines. Well, at least they did in the 80s. So how do we start? Well, there is a traditional thing that says where you start at page one, you keep writing until you get to the end of the book. Well, obviously with this sort of book where you could jump around, that's not how it worked for me. I started writing up these anecdotes and as they became more full, I, I created longer pieces and I connected them together, going in whichever order I thought was interesting based on general opinion. So that was, oh, the microcomputer, okay, we need a bit on that. Oh, we should have a game thing. What about games that crash on certain levels? Okay, that's an interesting thing. And by the time I'd got to my word limit, I, was actu I actually went over my word limit by about 100%. <laughs> um, but that's okay, because when you, I, we'll come to it later really, but. I got the stories out. I could have just stopped and said, right, I've hit my limit, that's fine. It's like, no, I know how to cheat the system. And we'll come how I did that later. So I did that and I was like, okay, I'll just write the anecdotes in the order that I find most interesting. So any that fall off the bottom are the least interesting ones. Also means I don't have to write about them. Unless there's an addition to, which you know, we'll see. So structurally, I was just writing very small text files 
with each entry in it. These were written in Markdown language for anyone that is interested in the technicalities of this. And in each directory on my drive, there was the Markdown text for the entry and there was a JSON file. That JSON file says what other connections this entry has to other connections. It also referenced what groups does this topic fit under. So if I was writing about the spectrum, it would be in a group called Sinclair, and that would tie all the Sinclair stories together. If it was about crashes in computer games, it would tie all of those together, and so on. And then I wrote a piece of program, it was in JavaScript, if anyone wants to hate me, now's your time, that went through this entire directory, read in all the JSON files, read in the markdown, generated HTML, which I could then load into a word processor and send off to a publisher that really likes things in Microsoft Word. <laughs> And my program, they did all the headings and that. And if you look at the book, uh, you know, because I can see some of you are already holding it, you'll see in the book it has little sections. So you'll read this section here on, for example, number 10, disabling the brake key. And it tells you about how people would disable the brake key on BBC Micros. And at the end, it has a bit saying, of course, these techniques can be subverted. And it says, go to 10, REM, BASIC. So after reading about the brake key, if you want to read more about BASIC, you go to section 10 basic. Or if you want to talk about Chucky Egg, go to 10, Tales of Chucky Egg. And all of these bits were created automatically by my software. So it would generate all the hard work for me. And if I change the structure of the book, I just rerun the program and it regenerates the book for me. A massive, massive time saver if anyone wants to do that. And of course, work begats work. So you're writing about something and you're, gonna, you're going away and you're just checking some fact or other. And you read it and you find a page and you say, oh yeah, I am right. I got it right. You know, the Wikipedia was right. And then you sort of read further down the page because you start getting interested. You go, well, that's three more stories I've got to include. And you make a note and you write them. And then you go and fact check them stories. And while fact checking those stories, another piece of information comes up and you've got to write that one as well. And it comes to the point where it just grows and grows and grows and will do if you let it. So the things I learned, I can see we've got some computer people here. So Jupiter race, what do we know or what did I know about the Jupiter race before writing the book? Well, the sort of things that everyone knows, it uses fourth. This was so prominent that the advertising covered almost nothing about the machine except it uses fourth. It's very much like a Sinclair ZX81 or a Spectrum. It's got the rubber keys of the spectrum. It has all, uh, almost exactly the same code in there for reading the keyboard as the ZX81. The only difference is this one symbol shift key here. All the other code is exactly the same. I wrote an emulator for the ZX81 and the Jupiter Race. They are exactly the same except for one line to change that shift key. That's how similar they were. It's almost like the person who built this worked at Sinclair, <laughs> thought, I can't be bothered with letting Clive have all this money, I'm going to set up my own company and build my own computer. Oh yeah, that's exactly what happened. Because these guys, Steve Vickers and Richard Altwasser, were working with Sinclair on the ZX81 and the Spectrum, or so and so. So they said, all right, we, we know what the Spectrum is doing. We'll do the same sort of thing, but we'll do it in fourth. We weren't quite ready for fourth at that time, but as a consequence, it didn't sell that many. And now these things are on eBay for 400 quid upwards which is why I haven't bought one. <laughs> so let's have a little look at the font. This is the font, and it looks a bit spectrum-ish. You can sort of, sort of, it's got that aesthetic. And this is stored in these memory locations. Um, for those that don't speak hex, there's 641 bytes between the start and the end memory location here. So this whole font is stored in 641 bytes. But if you count the number of characters here, it should take 1,024. So what have they done? Well, if we look at these symbols, these ones at the top, there is some code that generates them programmatically. They're pretty simple, they're duplicated. So it's very simple to have a, just a few bytes of code that generates these first 16 characters. There you go, that, that saved quite a few hundred bytes straight there. What else do we have? We've got a copyright symbol. And they've got a special piece of code that copies the copyright symbol into the font area. All of this, all the font data is stored in ROM. And when the computer needs to display it, it has to read it from RAM. So when the program starts, it reads it from ROM, does this magic and writes it to RAM. What about the rest? Well, all the other characters have a few things in common. Look at all, look, every character on here 
although it's, it's difficult to see, has a blank line at the top. Why do the characters have a blank line at the top? So when you stack two characters on top of each other, there's actually a gap between them, and you can read the text legibly. So if the top line of every single character is blank, why bother storing it? So they didn't. They then said, oh, look, we've got capital letters. None of these have descenders. You know, the Y, it goes below the line. So all these capital letters do not need a bottom line either. So they only store six characters for each of those, uh, for each of those letters. And all of this saves 383 bytes of memory, which was worth doing because... Oh, that's, that's another bit. Don't worry about that. So if you're saving 363 in total, but you are having to generate the symbols with one piece of custom code, copy the copyright symbol on its own as a piece of custom code, and then do this blank line at top or black line, blank line at bottom routine with separate more You're only using 64 bytes of code to save 340 odd bytes of actual data space. So that was actually worth doing. And the fact someone went to that effort, I thought was quite interesting. As we said, the only symbol that is copied in its entirety is the copyright symbol. It's the only one which is full eight characters high and is not programmatically generated. So, spoilers, you probably know the next computer that's coming up. <laughs> it's the Dragon 32. What do we know about the Dragon? Well, it's a cousin of the Tandy Coco. It's not a copy. Both the Tandy and the Dragon were created from Motorola specifications. Motorola said, hey, we've got a chip. If you want to use this chip in a computer, here's the circuit diagram. This is how you do it. And they said, oh, but if you wanted to display things on a TV, we also sell you a chip that does that as well. Oh, and you want a connection to the I.O. ports? Yeah, we sell you a chip for that as well. So essentially, Motorola were giving away a spec for anyone to build their own computer. Tandy took it, Dragon took it. They both built a computer that quite naturally is going to be very, very similar to each other. It uses the 6.0 processor. It's a very nice processor to work with. It uses a version of Microsoft Basic, and it's known for the color green. What color green is it known for? This color green. This is the default background of the Dragon 32. It is a rather horrendous green, which is why every computer game on the Dragon looks like this. Well, not every game on the Dragon. People realized that this wasn't a good look for a machine, so they ended up doing things in black and white. I mean, yeah, sure, that color scheme might be good if you're blind, but for anyone else, you want to see the game. So what they did is they said, well, let's just do it in the black and white mode. We get higher resolution, graphics look better, and it's only going to get printed in black and white magazines anyway. So let's do it. And this is a very, it's very similar to a technique the Spectrum programmers used. The Spectrum, as probably most of we know, has a color clash. If you have a red character and a green tree, and the red character goes over the green tree, either your character goes green or your tree goes red. You've got no choice. So what a lot of those programmers did is they said, well, let's just make one of the colors very monochromatic, so it at least won't change color. The dragon went the whole way. We just make the whole thing black and white. And these are some of the popular games you'll probably recognize, uh, a version of Donkey Kong and Jet Set Willy and Airball. But this is, this is one of the interesting bits that I found about the Dragon. Now, the program code here isn't that important. What it's essentially doing is say, take the value of A stored in a register, uh, you know, just a, a variable store essentially, and write it to this memory address. And now write it to this memory address and this one and this one and this one. And this transfers data between the main CPU and the SAM chip, which is in charge of doing some of the graphics work. What is interesting about this is it's not transferring any data at all. To save money, they didn't connect the data channel between the CPU and the chip. So there was actually no way to send data across. So what the chip did is just says, oh, I've seen you've used this address. That means this bit is set to zero because it's even. If you use this address, it sets that bit to zero because it's even. But if you do it on an odd address, it will set exactly the same bit to one. That way, you don't need to send data across. It takes longer. You're sending more instructions, but it's actually quicker. And because you're not putting data onto the bus in reality and taking it off, that bit is quicker as well. It's a technique that was later used in the Archimedes uh, machine. They weren't the only ones to do this. And if anyone wants the full gory details, there are URLs at the bottom of the screen. The Game Boy. 
I'm sure at least two people in here have programmed an emulator for the Game Boy, so might accidentally have to tell me more than I know. But here are some of the things that I did know about the Game Boy. The CPU is a bit like the Z80, it isn't exactly, but it's fairly close. You can see the lineage there. It had four shades of green. Not the shades of green the Dragon had, but something that was at least passably pleasing. And it had an early form of DRM. And it's the copy protection element here that I'm gonna focus on. So you're not expected to read this code, but this is the entirety of the boot ROM for the Nintendo Game Boy. When you start up your Game Boy, it says, right, I've got to start up. I've got to initialize my machine. I've got to play this little ping sound. I'll animate the logo and I'll check that the game cartridge that's been plugged in is actually a legitimate cartridge. How does it do that? Well, it does it with some code. And what this code does is it says, there is a piece of data in my memory that must match the data in your memory. So it queries the cartridge and says, wait, cartridge, you must have these exact set of bytes in this exact order at this exact memory location. Because if you do, you are allowed to rerun and it will run the game on, on the Game Boy. And that seems a fairly simple thing to do. It just checks that they're all the same. If any one of them differs, it just spins in a loop going nowhere. That's all it does. So what is so special? What's this data all about? Well, it's that. And I think that's fairly obvious, right, of why this is the data they chose as their copy protection. What does this data do? Well, it's the, it's the logo. When you boot up the Game Boy, it does this logo and it does a little wiggly pattern, right? So the data they check for is actually the logo in the boot ROM. Why is this interesting? Well, if you require your, your games to have the Nintendo logo in their code, and that's a, a duplicate of the Nintendo logo, then you can be taken to court because you don't have permissions to use the logo, which is a breach of trademark law. Plus, if you just copied the data wholesale, that's a breach of copyright law. So whichever one you try getting out of, there's another law to get you. And this is one of the early attempts of people such as, as I say, as Nintendo, to stop people from doing it. Spoiler alert, they didn't. Pac-Man. What do we know about Pac-Man? Well, originally called Puck-Man. Yes, of all the things of the talk I've practiced, it's getting this slide right. <laughs> It could have been called Puckman if it wasn't for the fact that someone in Japan suddenly realised that teenage boys with marker pens might like to change it. <laughs> it was released in 1980, which is important because, as you will remember, and as you can see from the shot, it's in colour. So in 1980, we were having colour games. And we're having colour games in three kilobytes of RAM. How on earth do you get a screen full of colour in 3K? Well, this is one of them, and this unfortunately is a little bit washed out, but it does it using two methods. It has tiles and it has sprites. These tiles, these are fixed blocks in fixed locations. So you can have perhaps one of 16 tiles placed in one of 600 locations. The, ma the maze, for example, is built with a series of tiles. You don't need any extra inf information because you know they go in sequence, one after the other. So you just need a simple number saying, which tile is it, which tile is it? No graphics required. So, Fewer graphics required. So there you go, you've saved a whole load of memory with tiles. And with sprites, yes, you need an X coordinate, you need a Y coordinate, and you need a what sprite image am I displaying. But the hardware also has magic in it that lets you flip the sprite vertically, horizontally, or vertically, or horizontally and vertically. So you only needed the memory to store one sprite, and the going up and going down was all handled automatically by the hardware saved an awful lot of memory, so you could fit everything into 3K. But there was a slight problem with some of the code that it did this. Now, you might recognize this. If anyone has played Pac-Man to level 256, you will recognize this screen. It looks corrupt. It looks like the screen is corrupt, but actually it's not the screen data that's broken here. It's the level counter data that's broken here. That's the level counter. You remember during the game, you'd get cherries or things and they'd appear about here and they'd get some bonus points. Well, as you progress through the levels, you get more of these little bonus cherries and they change from uh, cherries to bells, to strawberries, to a few other things. And when you get to level 256, it really has no idea what things it should be printing. It starts at one, level one, and goes all the way up to 256. Now, as the computer geeks in the room will know, 
you cannot store the number 256 in one byte of data. They were using one byte of data, so level 256 is level 0. So it starts at level 1 and it goes, oh, level 2, level 3, level 4, I'm going to get to 256 in a minute, and it never does, because it goes back to 0 and starts counting again. And it gets completely lost. And that's why this thing at the end is actually the interesting part of why does it corrupt in this way? We can see it's going to corrupt, obviously, if it's just going way over there. But why does it corrupt like this? Well, this is how memory is organized inside the Pac-Man machine. The very first address of memory, the place where everything starts, is down there. But not at the bottom, at the second line from the bottom. So if you work your way through memory sequentially, you start here, you go along, you go down one line to here, you then go here and go up, 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 all the way to here, and then you go and start at the top and go across and go across. So following that through, if you follow that memory map and you're writing data you shouldn't be writing, you're starting here, you're going across, and you can see how this gets corrupted. And then it goes down here, and you see how this is getting corrupted. Then it starts going up the screen vertically, because that's how the memory works, all the way up here, which is why the top doesn't get broken, because it never gets that far, and that's why it starts from the right and ends about halfway. And it just picks up any random junk it finds in memory to display there. And I thought that was quite amusing. The ZX81. What do we know about ZX81? It has 1K of RAM. It has no sound, it has no colour, and no point to it whatsoever. <laughs> but we loved it. It was my first machine. And I had 1K chess and I had 3D Monster Maze. And one of the things I argue in the book you know, is that 1K chess, although it's not a good chess program, it, I, you know, I could beat it as a kid, I could beat 1K chess. But it came out quite early in the life cycle of the machine. And it kind of made a point that even with 1K, you could actually write a chess program. At which point people would be thinking, ah, oh, you can get 1K chess program. Maybe it's not such a useless machine after all. Maybe there is po something possible with this machine. And I, I do think that might be one of the reasons it had a slightly longer life than it would otherwise have done. But this is the thing I think most people think of with the ZX81, the RAM pack. The 16K RAM pack that you put on the back, and if it wobbles, the whole machine falls apart. Now... It is certainly debatable whether it did cause the machine to crash or it's just it overheated anyway because the amount of space in the case didn't let the heat out or anything else. But it's, it is the popular story that when you put the, the 16K RAM pack on the back and it wobbles, you lose everything. And of course, if you're typing on this flat piece of plastic, everything is going to wobble. So it is likely to happen. And there's lots of things in the book on the ZX81 that are a very technical and long-winded, which I'm not going to go into. But this was something I found that was quite curious. I was taking a picture for the book. I thought, I've got to have a shot of the ZX81 and its RAM pack. And then I saw the gap. It's like, well, of course there's a gap. You know, they're, they're, they're built wrong. No wonder it wobbles. And I thought, what is the angle between the ZX81 and the 16K RAM pack? And yes, it's 16 degrees. Give or take. So those are some of the things that I learned during writing the book. Uh, there's a load of others, but those are the ones we're going to focus on now. So what happens? I've just finished writing that last bit of text. Then what happens? Well, editing and lots of it. So it goes through multiple edit stages. There's a, there's a first edit stage is to make sure I've got my worms in the correct order, that I haven't given you any typos, the grammar is roughly correct. There's another editing stage where people go through and check the facts are roughly right. And um, this is also quite difficult when the words have been changed from your original meaning, because there's always a slight difference. One of the big problems is BASIC. BASIC was created in 1964, sort of, but didn't become really useful until 65 when there were strings added to the language. But also some people like to think of it as 66, because that's when it had a proper distribution outside a very small group of people. So what year do I use? So I have to put very specific wording in to say the time that the basic had its language to support strings or something less wordy than that. Then there's a whole process of zhuzhing. Because apparently my title was not zhuzhi enough. So my original title was 20 go to 10, retrocomputing by numbers. But apparently 
uh, that's not usually enough, so they came up with retrocomputing through the numbers to the ultimate numerical guide to retrocomputers. Oh, boy. That's not going to fit on the book. I, so I said, uh, OK, I'll think about it. I also then suggested, what about an adventure with retrocomputers? Or a journey in retrocomputing? An adventure guide to retrocomputing? The Retrocomputing Guidebook. A guidebook to retrocomputing. You can see where I'm going with this. Anywhere to steer it away from ultimate numerical guide. <laughs> they said, yeah, we don't know. OK, let me have another go. What about using numbers instead of words? Retrocomputers 101. The noughts and ones of retrocomputers. 1001011 facts about retrocomputing. Now, spoiler alert, you can probably have a clue that we're getting somewhere close. But that wasn't even the end of it. The 0 to 1 of retrocomputers, the A to Z of retrocomputers, but with the A to Z crossed out and 0 to 42947295 written above it. Yeah, I like that one. They didn't get it. <laughs> also, even thinking about things like retrocomputers on the number line, bits of retrocomputing. I thought that was very cute. Um, retrocomputing connections, interactions with retrocomputers, um, importance of retrocomputing, 1001 tales about retrocomputing, and 1001011 bits about retrocomputing. I thought that is the peak cuteness I can get. And it's like, no, nah, we don't like them. But backwards and forwards, we did end up agreeing on the whole facts on retrocomputing thing, which was good. It was, you know. So the cover is another thing that has to be zhuzhed up. When we first announced, this was the cover. It's still visible on certain t-shirts that you cannot buy on the internet. But if you want the image to upload it yourself, I'll send it to you. That's all I did. It's not a bad cover. It's got that sort of BBC font thing. It's got the reference to some games. It, importantly, it includes my name correctly. And I thought, yeah, that's a workable cover. I could see that in a store and It'll, it'll get someone's attention. I mean, that was almost the first one we had. These were the first four cover options we had. Here, in this case, they, you know, they haven't spelt my name right. It's not Steve, it's Stephen. Not that anyone cares. Um, and they had this one, which was quite nice. It looks a bit like a Spectrum. If the, if the Matrix film was produced with a ZX Spectrum and a color clash, <laughs> this is what that little screensaver thing would look like. And I like that. I thought, that's quite good. Uh, and I thought these were good. They were, they're fairly standard. They are these traditional, what, you, what would you think of about retro computer? If you were thinking about what would an old computer look like, what was the screen look like, you'd probably think something like this. I didn't like the lowercase go to. I didn't really like it being split across several lines. So we ended up going for that one. And they just said, well, it's OK. It's a placeholder. OK, fair enough. I quite like it. It's a placeholder. And then book was finished. They said, great, we'd like you to approve the actual cover for us. Oh, you'd like me to approve. You don't want me to comment on it. You want me to approve it. What do you want me to approve then? Please include the attachment. And that's what they gave me. Copyright violation from Nintendo and from Sega and Retro Computers and, yeah, a few others, I think. It's like, that's probably not a good idea. And they go, ah, oh, yeah, we, we hadn't thought of that. So let's have another go. And they gave me these three. Uh, this one, essentially, you've got the uh, facts about computers on the keyboard and the 20 go to 10. Again, quite nice. Go to is capitals on one line. This time, the subtitle, facts about computers, is above the title. OK, fair enough. Little blurbs, little slashy things. And this one, which I thought looked quite contemporary, which is why I've put it larger. <laughs> and when I sent back my comments, I sent it back in a larger form. Yeah, they didn't like that either. Because this was my favourite, and I think that was theirs. So, difference of opinion here, Jeff. So, and we went, ultimately, for this one. Now, you notice, that's quite similar, but not exactly the same. I, I like this, because I like the fact this is split non-symmetrically and non-obviously along the axis. The text is clear, it's bold, it's punchy, the colours are good. Didn't like 20 go to 10 being split on separate lines. That, I, you know, it's not important to most people, but for me, I think it looks wrong. Doesn't look like it did back in the 80s. So I said, could you just move that up the top? I know this thing, oh, and we, you know, we don't talk about printers much in the book. You know, we still can't get printers working correctly. <laughs> so don't put printers in. 
And I said, put them out the top and then fiddle about. And within a couple of hours, the designer come back and said, well, what about that one? It's like, yeah. I've had enough arguing about book covers and subtitles and everything else. It's good. It's going to annoy some people who prefer the original book cover. But I think it's better overall. And that's what we did. That, that got approved. That got sent off to printers. And then I had to go and sign some books once they'd come back. And I went down to Swindon, which is some, I, I knew it was somewhere over there. I just didn't know how far over there it was. <laughs> and I went down and I said, oh, hello, come in. And, it, and it's in the middle of a, a trading estate in the middle of nowhere. And it's like, OK, come in. And, you know, the guy was very nice. He, he took me in. He said, if you want tea and coffee, they're over there. Turn right around the corner. Offices on the left hand side, big open plan area on the right. And this stuck in the middle. This is a pile of books. There's 16 in each of these little sections here. And this pallet has about 900 books on it, weighing 320 kilos. I had to sign about 680 of them. And if you want to know how big this is, here is a computer geek for scale. <laughs> There's quite a lot there to get through. So for the next six hours, I was sat there with only this to look at. It's on a little circular table. There's a couple of chairs. And there's a sealed packet of 16 books like this one, which I'd pick up from my right hand side, put them on, slip, slip open the packaging, take them out, sign them, put them at the back, one after another, keep going. When the table was full, I carried them to a second pallet, stacked them in piles of 12. Once they were all done, I'd move on to the next one. Time after time after time. I got to choose my own pacing. I could work as fast, as slow as I liked, as long as I got them all done which I sort of did, all stacked up neatly. But I thought I was like, I've finished, I've done, I'm f it's all brilliant. And then a um, guy comes along and goes, um, about 200 books short. It's like, well, no, one, two, three, four, five, six, kind of one time to multiply by 16, I, we've got them all. No, because they were taken off in packets of 16. I was told to stack them in stacks of 12. And during this process, my brain had been addled by doing nothing but signing and listen to some bad radio station in the warehouse next door. My brain had gone blue. So I'd miscounted. So I just had to sit down and sign another couple of hundred. Yeah. And by the end of the day, I mean, just through this endless repetition, my own name ceased to have any meaning whatsoever. <laughs> you know, it's a term called semantic satiation, I think. Satiation. Um, and it's usually described to hear effects of words being repeated. And you can try it for yourself. Just say a word over and 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 over again. You see, it suddenly just loses anything. And it's, it's really weird. Um, and as a consequence of that, my signature deteriorates in some places. It gets invigorated in others. So if you need to support a former self-help group for people who have the book signed, get together and you can work out which books were signed before which other books just by how badly I've forgotten my own name. <laughs> so looking back, what, have we, what, what, what sort of timescales are we looking at if you want to do the book? So on the 26th of July 2011, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2021, we launched the campaign. July 21. On the 26th of January, 2022, we got to 100%. 185 days to get everyone that at least definitely wanted to be involved, involved. That's pretty good. That's six months. That's a pretty good turnaround. And that coincidence of being 26 was also quite nice. Because when you've been writing a book on numbers for so long, any number that matches any other number just seems to become more significant than it was the day before. In March, I got my first full draft. Well, you know, January, February, March, it's only three months to finish a full draft. And that was 174 pages. I then put out the call for my favorite machine. So in the book, we said, well, if, if you're on the book, you know, pledge for the book. But if you want your favorite machine to be included, include it. You know, tell me what it is and I'll make sure there's a section. And I thought, no one's going to bother with this. <laughs> yeah, so I had to go away and write 49 extra sections, 49 <laughs> more pages. But because the backers had asked for it, the publisher couldn't tell me to take it out. So instantly, I've got an extra 49 pages in that book. Cheating, you might say. So that was in March. I'd finished that. In August, I'd got my final draft. 
In September, I'd got my final, final honours. This is really going to be the final draft. And come uh, January 2023, the first draft was returned to me from the publisher saying, we've had a read through and this is what's wrong with it. <laughs> yeah, some poor sap had to sit over Christmas reading my book, fixing all of my mistakes. But this was January 23. By April 23, I had checked everything. I had fixed everything they'd asked me to fix. I'd sent it back to me, to them, to me, to them, to me, to them. And I'd got page proofs by the 26th of June. It's another 26th. On the 21st of September, a box arrived containing these for me. And then on the 26th of October 2023, we ended up launching the book. Well, that's today. Also another 26th, which makes it 822 days, two years and three months since first telling people, do you think this is going to be any good to us actually getting it out to people? 822 days. This is roughly what it looks like. Um, <laughs> these blue spikes are people supporting the book over time. And this is the percentage that we needed. And you can see right bit, and this is very typical of all crowdfunding things. At the beginning, you get some nice sharp spikes as people are suddenly discovering it and it's getting onto the various forums. Then there'll be a gap and then the forums that do sort of more weekly postings will suddenly get some spikes. And then it will be featured somewhere and you get some more spikes. And towards the end, as we, as we approach this 100% line, a lot more people are saying, oh, come on, it's nearly there. Just, just one more, just one more. And you get this extra spike. And then it sort of tails off mostly. But every now and again, it appears in a blog somewhere or someone posts it or includes it on a YouTube video and you get an extra little spike. And it's really quite gratifying to see. One of the weirdest spikes is about here. If this is January, that's probably December, right? And this is probably about Christmas Eve. <laughs> on Christmas Eve, whilst on holiday, my phone kept pinging and saying, Oi, we got more, we got more. It had been posted, there was a blog in Brazil. That, in fact, it was a blog on computer security. And the, for some reason, the people who run the security, computer security blog also happen to like old computers. And they just posted it. And then pretty much everyone who lives in Brazil who'd ever owned a computer suddenly go, went online to buy the book. I had no idea there was that big a market out there for it. And there was. So, you know, that was a Christmas Eve rather interestingly spent. So as a book about numbers, I should probably do the meta book about numbers. So the most covered number in the whole book is four. There are nine entries revolving around the number four. Four proof runs from me to them to me to them. Eleven appendices, one of which is labelled 4,000 million, because it's the largest number you can get with an uh, unsigned 32-bit integer. I thought I was the only person who will have 4,000 million uh, appendices in my book. Turns out Matt Parker also has one in one, in one of his books, but you know, you'd expect that. There were some secret entries that are unlisted in the contents. So if you're going through the book properly from section to section, you will not discover these. There is a whole section on random coincidences, co coincidences that are quite fun. There's a selection of geeky jokes that are quite fun. There's some other sections which have got nothing to do with anything else except numbers, which you will find. If you just think, I wonder if that number's in there, you might find it. Or you might not, if you search for the number 404, for example. <laughs> Everyone's now going to look to see what's at 404. Uh, that, well, I have one word, word in the book that's 29 letters long, which I included because I was, one of my editors told me, oh, you need to explain this fear of 666 a little more clearly. So I said, isn't there a word for the fear of 666? <laughs> and isn't it 29 letters long? Well, if the editor says so, what in there? Love it. Uh, we had 49 machines covered. Um, there's 58 lines of a basic program you can type in for the BBC Micro. And just like the authentic type in basic programs for magazines, this one's actually going to work. Um, yep, 77, you know, we've got some entries. And these numbers are now out of date. Because even in the last week, we've had another five or six people go on the site and said, yeah, we, we want book. So it's still going. So I suppose with all that, I should probably read something, right? Or I could get some, other peop some of you to read it for me. You've got the books. So what, sh what should we find? Let's try this one, 1500. Computer sounds in music. The idea of computer-generated sounds being used in and for music was a long battle. Initial attempts were monophonic square wave beeps that were never quite in tune. 
and so were regarded as a gimmick. Ironically, when computers were professional enough to generate quality music, the industry only used the noises from retro computer games like samples of Pac-Man, which you'll see on the EP Power Pill, which is a moniker for Richard D. James, a.k.a. Aphex Twin. Or sometimes it will be a Russian folk song, like Korobiniki, as you hear in Tetris. The Tetris theme was remixed and a dance version was created uh, by Dr. Spin, uh, which was a collaboration between Nigel Wright, a pr music producer, and a musical theatre composer called Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yes, that one. Pac-Man was also the inspiration for some literal lyrics on a track called Pac-Man Fever by Buckner and Garcia in 1981. In the US at least, it was a hit, selling over half a million copies, going gold and reaching number nine on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. Now, one band that is often credited with bringing computerized music to the masses is German band Kraftwerk. With their futuristic sounds and precise electronic rhythms, they are the poster bots of the field. Seriously, that joke works better written down. <laughs> Ironically, at the time of their groundbreaking 1981 album, Computer World, none of them owned a home computer. Nor did they use computers in the studio. Ultimately, one track from the album, Computer World, was appropriately used by the UK broadcaster BBC for their TV computer education programme called The Computer Programme. Yet the computer on the aforementioned cover did exist, and it was the Hazeltine 1500. Quite a rare thing if you ever happen to find one. Number 64, Spanish import law. I'm sure this is a topic most of you know about, so we'll cover it briefly. There are so many things connected with the number 64. The 64K address space of 16 bits, which is 0 to 65535. The numeral on machines such as the Dragon, Pecom and Oric Nova. And 1964 was the year in which BASIC was released. Again, having to formalize the BASIC timeline. But it's also the threshold in a slightly obscure piece of Spanish legislation from September 1985. The law was that any imported computer with a memory of 64K or less would be taxed at 15,000 pesetas per machine. Consequently, Amstrad, who wanted to sell their 64K machine into the Spanish market, would see their 25,000 peseta price tag raised to 40,000, which would have certainly killed any chance of getting sales there. So they upgraded the RAM to 72K, added an 8K chip onto a new daughter board. However, as you've probably seen, and you will have done if you've read the appropriate sections in the book, the address space of a 16-bit machine is only 64K. That's all it can reference. You've got 16 bits, you have access to 64K and nothing else. So extra circuitry is required to make use of any extra memory. Other computers of the era would use bank switching technology or something similar, allowing the programmer to choose which memory chip in its entirety would be used at any particular time. Amstrad didn't pay any money for this extra chip. Their solution was to not connect the chip. <laughs> this meant they could print 72K on the case of the machine, and they could show any overzealous customs officers that, look, there is 72K's worth of chips in the machine, and they could therefore import their machine at a reasonable price. And this was called the CPC 472. I mean, it's not known, and I've spoken to some of the people who actually own this machine, no one knows whether the chips even worked. Maybe they were taken from the rejects bin at a chip supplier, uh, Ryan, who supplied them. We don't even know if it, the Amstrad engineers fitted it in the UK or it was carried out by the Spanish distributor, Indescomp. But pictures exist of that fabled machine, and this is one of those fabled machines here. And when you get the book, you'll be able to see that this ribbon cable is so tight, you can't turn it over. Even if you wanted to see whether it's soldered in or not, you couldn't do it. So one more piece, and I'll read this one because it seems to be the only bookmark I have left. <laughs> 720, copy protection. With piracy being rife throughout the computer scene, developers and publishers have looked to increase complex methods to protect their code. First with tapes, then with disks. A lot of the initial protection methods was to stop you reading and modifying the code, since if you could do this, it was a simple matter to type save and create a perfect copy. In the cassette eras, publishers would use fast loaders and other technical tricks to load the game in a non-obvious way, all of which could be subverted with a dual tape deck. 
the analog hole. One of the largest manufacturers of such machines were Amstrad, the same Amstrad that cheated on the memory and the same Amstrad that bought Sinclair. They proudly had an advert that says, it tapes tapes. They were almost encouraging the thing to attack their own machines. But for those who couldn't afford a new tape machine, software copiers were available for tape and disk machines. So this sort of thing only affected the casual copier, the bedroom people, those at school who just shared tapes. To prevent commercial piracy, some companies would use a distinctive livery, perhaps a brightly colored body or custom printed tape leader. This had two obvious problems. The first was not all versions of the program would be identical, as the fluctuations in stock availability would vary over the lifetime of the product. The second was that unless the consumer already knew that a genuine tape should be blue, they would have no way of knowing. And this also assumes that the people buying this stuff actually care whether that dodgy bloke off the market is selling legit stuff or not. The photocopied inlay should have given you a clue. Knowing they couldn't stop folk copying the game, publishers included additional paraphernalia in the box, which was necessary to run the software. Items they hoped would be less easy to copy. The dongle was one such idea. Dongle. It would be plugged into your machine and the software would check for its existence. The mechanics of the dongle varied as each company sought to invent its own techniques, both to reduce licensing costs and to avoid the liability so that if one dongle was cracked, it didn't affect the efficacy of all the software using it. Some dongles needed to remain in the computer for as long as the program was running, while others, like the joystick port uh, dongle that was used in Buzzard Bait for the Dragon 32, that only checked its existence upon load. And that one is kind of an interesting case that they, they protected Buzzard Bait with this dongle because they wanted to protect their IP of Buzzard Bait, even though Buzzard Bait was a copy of a game that someone else had written and they just nicked it. Also, Lenslock from ASAP Developments Limited. They attempted to solve the piracy problem by supplying a small set of prisms in a plastic case which would refract a scrambled image on screen to an unscrambled image off screen. Unfortunately, such a real world device meant real world problems, such as it not working on TV screens that were too large, or small, or ill positioned, or not high quality, or not configured properly, or pretty much everything else. But for every negative, there was a positive, and the computer's inability to generate a truly random number meant that the scrambled image on the screen was always <laughs> AD. <laughs> but the most famous system was probably the 720 color-coded squares on the software protection card that came with the software project's game, Jet Set Willy. And it's accredited to padlock systems. The squares were split into a grid labeled zero to eight and A to R. And the program would start by asking you to enter the four colors at square H7, for example. You were given two attempts to get this right. Failure to do so meant the computer would forcibly restart. At a time when color photocopiers were expensive, it would not be unusual to find kids spending their maths lesson copying out the whole card. And since the colors were mapped to the one, two, three, four on the spectrum, this did not take you as long as you might think to actually do. I know, I mean, I didn't copy it, obviously, but I know that someone in my maths lesson managed to do it before we even got to hard, long division. But of course, you can just bypass the protection system just by merging the code into memory, adding a poke, and saving it back out again. And you know, supplying paper-based products was certainly a cheaper alternative to the hardware dongles that had existed before, particularly when the paper was going to be included anyway. So when games like Jeff Crammon's Formula One Grand Prix from Microprose needed a large manual to explain the nuances of the simulation, it made sense for the game to start with a question, asking for a word from the manual in the form page, paragraph, line, word. Sometimes the printing was done on no copy paper so that uh, if you tried photocopying it, it rendered it useless. And The Secret of Monkey Island, that had a dialer pirate interactive code wheel in keeping with the theme of the game and an unsubtle reference to piracy. This consisted of two pieces of circular card. They were fixed in the center of the pin and half a face was on the inner wheel and half was on the outer wheel. So you would rotate the inner and the outer wheel to match the pirate and then you would have to type in the numbers on the inner wheel that matched what was shown on the program. Such paraphernalia worked. With all software, whether on tape or on disc, 
But the move to disks provided new technological opportunities to prevent the software being copied in the first place. Dungeon Master on the Atari ST, developed in 1987 by FTL Games, used a fuzzy bit. This section of the disk is neither zero or one, but it's indeterminate. So it might change whenever it's read. You read it twice, it comes up with two different values, all the same, it's just impossible. So naturally, if you made a copy of the disk, the computer would read that disk with a fixed value, uh, you know, with a random value, but then write it back out with a fixed value. So when anyone came to read that value back, it would not be fuzzy anymore, and they could detect a pirate copy. But the developers were also smart enough to include other protection methods that did not exhibit any ill effects of a copied game until you'd been playing for quite some time. This was quite popular after a while when people started realizing piracy was a thing. They'd say, yeah, we'll let you play for 10 or 20 minutes or get to this level, and then we'll make the end level boss impossible to complete. Or we'll let you get through right to the end, and then we'll crash the machine for you if we detect it's a pirated version. Because pirates didn't play the games. They cracked them and they shipped them. So creating such a scheme uh, required custom hardware with companies like ZMac record, could also record a fat track which had adjacent tracks containing identical data, all perfectly aligned. And this is something that a consumer disk drive could never do. But all software needed to check that the copy detection was in place, and so a crack of the game that didn't include the check would bypass all the work they did. Creating such a crack was not necessarily difficult, as custom hardware units like IcePick for the Commodore or Multiface for the Spectrum allowed you to save snapshots of the software immediately after the copy protection screen and or you could just watch the game running and see how the copy protection was running. So those are some elements from the book. There are 169 facts according to the thing. You've heard three, <laughs> plus a little ad libs. So I will say thank you for your attention. And if we've got questions, there is a mic that will be coming around for you to ask them. This is probably the last question, really, rather than the first, but I'll ask it now. Where, where do you go after, after this sort of book? Are, are you thinking never again, or will there be 30 go to 40? So where will it go after this? Uh, I don't know. If there's going to be another book in this style, then this has to prove itself out there. Everyone that says, yes, I definitely want it, has got it now. We've got to see, were there enough people that we didn't know about that wanted enough to say, yes, it's worth doing more. At which point I may do another one. I've certainly got enough material to do other ones. And there's certainly a lot that I had to prune out when we were going through the editing process. It's, you know, it says starts at 170 odd pages. It ends up being 280 something. I, I, you know, some of my other drafts were 300. So there's still a lot of other material, but it is still do the, do I want to do this type of book or uh, do I want to do a different type of book on retro? Uh, one of the ideas, and if anyone's watching this and you want to write the book, go ahead, steal my idea, write the book, because then I don't have to, yeah. would be um, a history of retro from a geographical point of view, where you might have a map of the UK, and it says, well, these companies were here, here, and here, and this is why they were here. Microprose is in Chipping Sodbury, in the middle of nowhere outside Bristol, because someone owned some office space, and they convinced the American publisher that this was going to be the Silicon Valley of England. <laughs> Those sort of stories don't fit in this format, but they fit in that format. Whether or not I would do a crowdfunding thing again, probably not. And that's not because of the amount of work that goes into crowdfunding. It's a horrendous amount of work. It's completely unappreciated by everyone involved. But we've got 800 and something people who supported this. 800. If I get 799 on my next version of crowdfunding campaign, I'm going to feel very disappointed in myself. Who's that one person I annoyed? That's going to annoy me more. The one person that didn't repeat compared to the 799 that says, yeah, that was a great job. Do it again. So I don't know what it's going to be. There are some, those are some ideas on where I might go. For now, I'm just going to have a break. Sounds sensible. I mean, I think um, just, just to sort of pick up on what you've said, it's around finding a novel angle, isn't it? Because there are, there's been a shed load of fairly bog standard retro computing books and obviously there's a there's a role for them but there's only mm. so many of them you can have yeah and it's doing something which is which is different and adding something that's not already out there yeah so if anyone has any ideas but they don't know how, have any you know how do we make this different enough 
I've got a stack of ideas I'm never going to use. Just ask me. You can have any of them. As I say, it's easier for me to buy a book than it is to write one. I've actually got two, I think. <laughs> First one, I think, is happen happening to know you. Is mm. there any reference to magic anywhere in the book? Yes. <laughs> cool. Uh, there are lots of references to lots of my other hobbies. Um, and, I, and I don't really like calling them hobbies because I actually get, do get paid for going out and doing magic shows. But there are references to magic in there. Some of them you will spot just because you'll spot them. Some of the references will only be spot by other magicians. If anyone, does spot, if anyone is not a magician and they spot some of those references, do let me know what you spotted and why you spotted it. Because I think I was quite subtle. Because I, I do that in all of my... Because I have to. When you're writing page after page, you've got to keep yourself awake and interested in the project. So you put in little in-jokes wherever you can find them. Um, and I'm a big fan, you know, I'm a magician, I'm a big fan of music, so there's lots of music references in there that you're not necessarily going to get unless you were a fan of that band or that singer. Uh, so, and, and there's a few beer references, obviously. So, yes, I, I keep, I, I was asked um, the other day, someone, someone posted their picture, the book had arrived, and they posted the picture, and they said, oh, this is great, I'm looking forward to the director's commentary version. <laughs> and I thought... You know, I don't think anyone wants to see me sit and read the whole book, but I could go through the book and point out where all the in-jokes are and just see who got the most and then give them a prize or something. And you had a second question. Well, it's the obvious question. What's your favourite entry? Uh, my favourite entry, it's, some of the time it's the Spanish tax law because it's one of those stories that most people haven't heard and when you talk about it and their solution to how do you not include lots of expensive hardware, well, you just don't include it and you hide it, is always quite an interesting approach. Um, I really like the one on prizes. There is a section on here about computer games giving out prizes. And on the, on the face of it, you go, yeah, of course computer games can give out prizes. Why can't they? But we're talking about retro computers. You've got a tape or a disc. You sit at home. You can play it for as long as you like. It doesn't go online. It doesn't check up on you. You can play that game as long as you like. You can disassemble this game. You can load it in, into a snapshot on a multi-face. You can hack the code apart. How do you stop someone in the privacy of their own home not going through the source code, working out how to get a high score, and then claiming the prize? And there's a, a, quite a big section on the book that talks about how, how people try to uh, solve this problem. People who are doing it for TV shows so back in the 80s, there was a TV show which was a murder mystery set in space. And it was broadcast on, I think, the Tuesday. And if you could solve the murder and then send back the, uh, send, send a postcard or a stamped, sealed stamped addressed envelope to the makers by Friday when they broadcast the solution, you got a prize. Of course, this was on TV. You could video this and play it back as many times as you want to try and work it out. That seems another impossible way to do prizes, the same way that games did. And obviously, we have uh, the golden hair as part of that story as well, because that is probably one of the most famous stories about prizes in computer game history. Number th 31,590. Let's just see. 31,900. Close. Has the Spanish uh, import law been repealed? Yes. <laughs> It was repealed about two months after it was put in place. There was almost no time for anyone else to act fast enough to say, oh, what do we do about this? It wasn't very popular. They just said, oh, let's just scrap it. And the acting fast is one of those interesting things about the Amstrad story generally. Alan Sugar was very good at moving fast to get quick stuff out to market. So the Spectrum Plus 2, for example, that came out very soon after we bought Sinclair. So a lot of people think, oh, the Sinclair did the plus two, and then Amstrad took it on later. No, but when M M Alan Shooker was looking to buy Sinclair, he had already lined up a whole load of people over in the Far East to build these plus two cases, to put this stuff together. So as soon as the ink was dry, he said, right, now, go, build it. So it came out very quickly, something that Sugar was good at. You, you mentioned dongles several times. Do you have the derivation of the word dongle? No, do you? Um, we were talking about this the other day and I, I read something ages ago about um, 
someone who, whenever there was something he sort of couldn't think of a name for, so there was a dongle, so, you know, what's this dongle thingy we're, we're going to do? And apparently this copy protection thing, he just sort of called a dongle because they hadn't got any other mm. name. After which he had to find a new word for things he <laughs> didn't have a name for. But that's, that's kind of apocryphal. So. And I really can't remember who it was, sorry. Mm. Yeah. But still a good story. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for your attention. And um, good night. I have no idea if there were snacks left outside or not. I certainly need one.